employment applications, housing rental options, and even now cell phone contracts. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about your credit report, um, maybe like a hands up or showing if anyone has actually accessed their credit reports before, you know, just maybe like a hands up. Um, so there are three credit reporting agencies. And I'm going to give you the names and the contact information for those. So we do have Equifax. And I'm going to have my coworker put up the information, um, Experian and TransUnion. Now, you might be wondering, like, what is a credit report? So like the name implies, your credit report tracks your credit activity. Now, there are several types of credit, including credit cards, store cards, personal loans, car loans, mortgages, student loans, and lines of credit. Now your credit report does not generally show the payment history for non-credit expenses, such as utilities, insurance, and medical bills, unless they go unpaid or, and are sent to a collection agency. Now, having said that, um, currently there is a program uh, that's called Boost, and it's something that's done by the Experian um, credit reporting agency, and you are able to, in certain circumstances, um, register like your credit card or your debit card if you're able to show that you're having like a utility expense taken out, you know, on a monthly basis. And if you go online, it can tell you a little bit more about the Experian Boost program that they have. And again, that's only for Experian for right now. Now, credit reports are built and maintained by these three credit bureaus. And as I mentioned earlier, there, there's three major credit bureaus in the US. And again, that's Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Now, the creditors usually report to them monthly, and the data is also obtained from court records. Now, since credit bureaus do not always collect the same information, your three credit reports can be, be different. So they could potentially report different information. So that's why I definitely recommend to my clients, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you pull bureaus from all three of the reporting agencies to compare the information. Now the credit bureaus sell your reports to interested parties such as creditors, insurance companies, employers and landlords who use the information to decide whether to lend or do business with you. Now, once you actually request your um, credit reports, and in addition to contacting the credit bureaus directly from the information that we gave you earlier, you can also use this phone number to order a credit report so for example, if you may not have access to the internet, you can also order a credit report by calling 888-397-3742. Now, once you do get a copy of your credit report, the credit reports are typically divided into four sections. So if you're looking typically at the credit report, the first section is typically going to contain your personal information. So this is gonna include things like your name, current and former addresses, and sometimes it may even have your employment history. Now keep in mind, I've seen on people's credit reports that it may not have their most up-to-date employer, and that's because they may not have applied for credit recently because that's typically how the credit bureaus are able to update information, especially if you've recently applied for credit and you've put down your current employer on the credit application. Now, the majority of your credit report 
is actually dedicated to the history of handling credit. So this is typically what we call trade lines. And what that will include, it will include things like the names of your creditors, the date the accounts were open, credit limits and original balances. And the balances and the payment history typically show for about 24 to 36 months. And they actually will give you the status of your accounts as well. And during the coaching session that you have with a smart money coach, we're gonna actually have access to pulling one of your credit bureaus through Experian. Now the third section of the credit report is what we call public records section. And this is where typically there's gonna be, if you have any public records that might be related to your credit worthiness, now this would be things such as if somebody had a lien against them, if you've maybe had a bankruptcy or filed bankruptcy, um, repossessions, judgments, and foreclosures. So this is typically where you don't wanna see anything under a public record section um, because if there is anything listed, then that's definitely something that you wanna investigate further. Now, the last part of the credit report um, has to do with an inquiry section. And this lists anyone who has accessed your credit report. So there's actually two types of inquiries. There's what we call a hard inquiry. And this is one that results from an application or a transaction that's initiated by you. So that means, for example, if you're applying for a new credit card, that's going to generate a hard inquiry on your credit report. Now, a soft inquiry, on the other hand, occurs when you pull your credit report yourself or it's checked for a reason not related to credit applications. And the only person that can see the soft inquiries on your credit report is you. So the other thing is this would mean if you're pulling your own credit reports online, and when we're pulling your credit report um, during the smart money coaching um, session, it does not impact your credit score because you're pulling it for educational purposes. One of the other things that I wanted to also just mention about the credit reports and when you pull copies of your credit reports, there are a couple of things that you can add to your credit report. So for example, clients can add what, what you call a fraud alert. And basically if you put a fraud alert on your credit report, now this means that companies that you apply for credit have to identify you before granting any new sort of credit. So this means they would typically call you to verify in fact that it is you applying for this credit. Now, all you have to do to put a fraud alert on your credit report is you just have to contact one of the major credit bureaus and they would actually notify the other two reporting agencies. Now, it's free to put a fraud alert on your credit report and it stays on there for one year. Now, as an alternative to a fraud alert, you can also put a credit freeze on your credit report. Now, a, a credit freeze, typically it's going to limit the access to even yourself. So you won't even be able to access your credit reports either. So you wouldn't be able to open up any accounts until you lift the freeze. And in this circumstance, if you wanted to put a freeze on your credit reports, you would in this circumstance have to contact all three of the credit bureaus. And then once you do contact them, put a freeze on your credit report, you typically are gonna get a PIN or a password. And you would need that each time you wanna lift the freeze and place it back on your credit report. Now credit freezes typically last until you lift it off. And one of the things that I do tell my clients is if we are gonna attempt to pull your credit report, 
and you have some sort of a credit freeze on it, I typically let the clients know if it's possible for them to temporarily lift the freeze so that I will have access to pulling their credit report um, during that time, and then they can put the freeze back on so that, again, your, your credit would be um, frozen at that time. Do we have any questions yet before I go on to the next slide? No questions yet. Okay. Next slide, please. So it's important to know that negative information like things like missed payments or collection accounts, they're not going to stay on the credit report forever. So most negative information like lawsuits, judgments, liens, foreclosures, in Chapter 13 bankruptcy, if you complete it and late payments remain on your credit report for, for about seven years. So I would say seven years. And if you file for a Chapter 7 bankruptcy, that's going to remain on your credit report from 10 years from the date that you filed the bankruptcy. So it's a little bit different between the chapter 13 and the chapter seven. So they usually will take it off in seven for the chapter 13 if you complete it. Whereas if you file the chapter seven, it can remain on there typically for 10 years. Now, when it comes to collection accounts, the longest it can stay on your record would be from the first date of the first delinquency with the original creditor. Now, no matter how many times a collection account passes from one agency to the next, because a lot of the time collection agencies may sell your account back and forth, the delinquency date remains the same. And therefore, the seven year time frame does as well. Now, positive information can be reported indefinitely as long as your account is still open. Otherwise, a positive account that was closed, for example, if you purchased and had a car loan and you paid it off without ever missing a payment, is typically going to remain on your credit report from 10 years from the date it was closed. Now, the most popular credit scoring models emphasize recent payment information. So typically older negative information won't affect you as much as what has been happening recently. So the more recent a late payment is, the higher weight it's going to carry on your credit score compared to, let's say, if you missed a payment from seven years ago. The FICO score usually emphasizes the last two years of your payment history. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about credit scoring. So you may wonder, well, what is a credit score? All it is is a numeric summary of information in your credit report. So it's formulated to predict your risk or the likelihood you will pay back what you borrowed and to make sure that you've stuck to your contract like an apartment lease agreement. Now, the most commonly used scoring model is the FICO score, and that stands for the Fair Isaac and Company score. And the range for scores range from 300 to 850. Now, there's also the possibility of not having a FICO score, and that's usually for someone who has not made any payments on any open and active accounts for an extended period of time, or someone who hasn't applied for credit at all. Now, most lenders do use this FICO score when approving for credit. And besides the FICO score, there are other models out there like the Vantage score, and that's usually, I think, with Credit Karma uses, for example. So if a lot of you maybe like register and have Credit Karma that monitors your credit, you may see something like what they use, the Vantage score. So now the higher your credit score, the less risk to the lender. 
So generally people with higher credit scores will have an easier time getting approved for credit and usually get better interest rates. Now you may ask, well, what's a good credit score? So there really is no standard for what constitutes a good credit score, but usually once you get into about a 620, that's what's considered to be a good score. And the national average right now is about 690. And typically you're gonna get the best interest rates if you have a score of 760 or higher. Now, looking at ways of how your FICO score is calculated. So, and this is something, you know, that we talk about also during your coaching sessions. So the main factor in determining your FICO score is your payment history. And that's about 35%. Um, they look at your payment history. So making your payments on time is going to boost your score. Now, if you make a late payment, your score is going to take a hit. So the more recent, frequent, and severe the lateness, the lower your score, and it's going to impact your, your credit score. Now, collection accounts and legal actions have a more serious negative impact. So as I talked about earlier, um, some of the things that stay on your credit report, so like filing a bankruptcy is typically going to have the most impact on your credit score. But again, even if you filed for bankruptcy, you, you can still reestablish credit and still improve your credit score. So filing for bankruptcy is not the end of the world. Now, another large chunk of determining factor in your FICO score is the amounts owed. So what that means is if you carry large balances on things like personal loans and revolving debt like credit cards, meaning that if you're close to your limits on those accounts, that would be potentially impacting your credit score. So if you have open accounts like credit cards and personal loans, keeping your balances very low in comparison with your credit limit is definitely what you want to do. And what they recommend, I would say, is no more than 30% of your balance in relation to your credit limit is what you should carry. And if somebody has no credit and they're just starting to establish credit, I would even recommend less. So less is always more. And again, that accounts for about 30% of your credit score. Now, a smaller portion of your FICO score has to do with the length of your credit history. So the longer you've had accounts, the better. And this is where I don't recommend clients close um, accounts, especially if you had an account open, you know, for a long period of time. So it's not recommended that you close the account. And even if you're not using the account, I do recommend to my clients that you make a charge every now and then. So that way you keep the, the credit history going. Because the other thing is, is if you don't use an account for maybe several months, the credit um, company may decide to close your account due to inactivity. And again, I'm not saying that's going to happen and I can't tell you at what point it may if you don't make a charge. So I would just recommend like every now and then making a purchase and then paying it off you know, every month. About 10% of your credit score has to do with new credit. So this factor looks at the number and proportion of recently opened accounts and the number of inquiries that you had. So many inquiries on your credit report may lower your credit score. So if you were trying to open up or you opened up a lot of accounts at the same time, potentially this could negatively impact your credit score. 
But for things, if you apply for like a mortgage or let's say an auto loan that occur within a 45 day period, it's only considered to be one inquiry for scoring purposes. And the reason that is, is because if you apply for a mortgage or let's say an auto loan, they may actually pull um, your credit report from several companies to try to get you the best interest rate possible. But again, the credit bureau is only going to look at that as one, um, one inquiry for scoring purposes. Again, if you do that within a 45 day period. And accessing your own credit report does not impact your credit score, nor do inquiries um, for pre approval offers. So you may see, like on your credit report, when you pull it, you may see soft inquiries where companies have accessed your credit report to see if they're going to offer you credit or if you're credit worthy. So again, these types of inquiries are not going to impact your credit score. And in addition, if we, when we pull your credit report during a coaching session, that also is not going to impact your credit score. And if you pull yours on your own as well. So if you have ever, as I mentioned, received, you know, like a pre-approval offer in the mail or via um, email, um, that's only going to create a soft inquiry on your credit report. Now, the other 10% um, of your FICO score has to do with the types of credit that you have open. So they may look to see if you have like a variety of, of accounts. So do you have credit cards, retail accounts, maybe auto loans, mortgage? So having different types of credit can also help to boost your credit score. Now, I'm not recommending that somebody go out and just get yourself an auto loan or an installment loan just to have a loan. You know, that's not something that I would typically recommend, especially if it's not something you necessarily need, unless you're maybe like trying to establish credit or maybe like for another purpose. So we're going to look at, you know, they're going to look at the overall um, makeup of the different types of credit that you have. And again, that's going to account for typically about 10% of your FICO score. So let's pause here for a minute. Any questions that we might have in the chat so far? Um, Howard, there's somebody with their hand raised. Um, Jen, do you want to mute yourself and ask your question? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, hi, thanks for uh, being here. This has been very informative. Um, I, my question is, is I recently am trying to reestablish my credit. I paid off a bunch of bad debt and my credit score obviously dropped. And my question is, is I just recently got a couple of credit cards so I could start reestablishing my credit. And I got a, I used my credit card a lot. I didn't realize the 30% um issue but um they even though i paid it before my time uh that that it was due and i paid it in full um they dropped my score 20 points how do i rebuild that and how long does that take to come back because i wasn't late on my payments and it my bill wasn't even due yet so that was a big blow yeah so i would say because your credit is being looked at you know on a Oh, Howard, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So when you applied or got these credit cards because you paid off old debts, are these secured accounts, secure credit cards? I have one secured and one unsecured. Okay. And so one of the things, as you just mentioned, that you want to look at, as far as trying to rebuild the credit after paying, you know, past due or old debts, you definitely want to make sure that you're making your payments on time with these new accounts. And typically what I've seen with my clients is on-time payment history for about three to six months, you will start seeing an increase in your score. 
you know, basically time is the most important thing. And, you know, as I mentioned, making sure that you're not charging up to the max, you know, um, on your credit card, because that potentially is going to lower your credit score. So, you know, as I mentioned, keeping it at 30% or less, even though you're paying it off, you know, um, before the before the statement is due, it may be that just at that moment, they're evaluating your credit score. And it looks like you may have a, a larger balance and closer to your, you know, credit limit. So again, um, secured credit cards is a good way to establish and improve your credit score. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, in, in a few slides coming up about other ways to help you either establish or, you know, um, ways to start bringing up your credit score. So I'm not sure, does that answer your question? Well, it answers part of it, but the other part is, do you know how, I mean, 20 points is a big, a big hit considering I wasn't late and it was only in the middle of the month. Um, so once again, I paid it in full, but do you know how long it takes for that 20 points to reestablish? Because that's huge hit. Yeah, I mean, I would probably myself have to take a look at the credit report. So I wouldn't necessarily want to make any guesses because I would want to look specifically at the credit report and see, because again, I would kind of look at, you know, where you were at previously when you got a credit score and then in between what may have happened to like lower your credit score. Um, it could be, did you apply for any maybe new credit? Like during the time you last um, got your score versus when you're getting your score now? No, not at all. I've just had my new credit cards for like two to three months and I just was using them to build my credit. And then all of a sudden um, I had, uh, maybe I got close to my limit, um, but again, it was only, I mean, it's due on the 25th. It was only the ninth of the month. And then I saw Credit Karma showed me that it went down 20 points. I was not late on any of my payments and it was the middle of the month. So I paid it off immediately. I mean, I was, that was my intention anyway, but I paid it off immediately, but the hit was, was shocking. Yeah. And again, that's Credit Karma. So they have their own scoring model because I believe they use Advantage. So I really can't talk too much. No, Experian about... also did the 20 point oh, it hit. Did. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, based on what you're telling me, the only thing that I could probably think of is that most likely there was a point where you are approaching your credit limits or getting close to them. And, you know, as I mentioned, that's about 30% of your score. So, you know, moving forward, my recommendation would be is just be mindful of how much you're carrying at any time, you know, on your credit cards. And I think hopefully that should, you know, bring the score back up, assuming that you're making your payments on time moving forward. Right. Again, do you know how long it takes or is that indicative to each individual person? I think it's going to be indicative, but I would say, I would say give it about three months. Okay, thank you. That's a big ouch, but thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, Robert. Akil has hello, hello, been Jen. raised. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I was just going to add that, yeah, Jen, um, everything that Howard said is, is correct, um, but one of the things we have to remember is that the um, reporting agencies, uh, they report every 30 days, so they have a reporting cycle uh, that they usually go by, um, so you're not going to see any changes. It's going to take um, at least at the very least a month to see any changes up or down on your credit report. Um, so um, as Howard mentioned, I would probably just give it a little bit of time, maybe a month or two to see the changes. But the, the, uh, the, uh, the most important thing that you can do for yourself is continue to make your payments on time and keep your, your, um, your usage down to the 30%, as you mentioned. And that's probably the quickest way for you to actually improve your credit score. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate your input. Absolutely. Um, next slide, Leah, please. So something we may have, you know, um, talked a little bit about before, but improving your FICO score. Now the score changes with credit activity, not only month to month, but each day. 
So if you're not satisfied with the way it looks today, you can change it by following credit wise actions and making them habits. So here's some ways to help your credit score. This goes without saying, but always pay you know, on time. And as I talked about earlier, your payment history makes up the largest chunk of your credit score. So making your payments on time is extremely important. Pay down your existing debt. So even if you've never missed a payment, a large debt load will lower your score. So you want to kind of explore ways you can lower your interest rates and free up cash to make more than the minimum payments so that you're not carrying large balances. Another way is to avoid taking on additional debt. So besides paying down existing debt, you want to make an effort to not take on more debt in the future. So I would say for revolving credit, ideally you should not charge more than you can pay off in full the next month. But at the very least, try to keep the balance well under, they say half of the credit limit, but I'm going to say even less than that. So about 30% or less. And also you want to check your credit report for errors because a lot of the times your report may contain um, score lowering errors. So check your credit report from the three bureaus at least annually. And typically before you used to be able to pull it free once every 12 months, but now due to the pandemic, if you wanted to pull it, and again, I don't recommend it, you could actually pull it weekly if you wanted to, free of charge. Now, they're not required to provide you free of charge a credit score. So if you wanted to get a credit score, there's gonna be an additional fee that they would charge for asking for a credit score. Now, if you notice any errors on your credit reports, you are able to dispute it directly online if you pull your credit reports online, or you can also send dispute by mail or by phone, you can do it as well. I recommend you go to annualcreditreport.com. So if you wanna jot that down, annualcreditreport.com. That's the website that I recommend to all my clients, you know, pulling their credit reports. And what's gonna happen, it's gonna ask you what reports do you wanna pull from? So I would recommend checking all three of them. And you're gonna have to go through an identification process so they are going to ask security questions. So in order for you to get access to it, you're going to have to answer those questions correctly. Otherwise, if they're not able to verify your identity, then you are going to have to most likely request it by mail. And they're going to request that you send in certain identifying information, such as your ID or um, other types of identification that they would let you know at that time. And again, there are also, you know, third parties like Credit Karma that actually provide their own credit reports for free for individuals who actually um, subscribe to that um, agency. And there are other things like personally for myself, if you have, I know, for example, AAA, they also have their own program where you can sign up for that, where you will actually get um, notices from them um, and you can access it. And it, it's kind of like a credit monitoring. So if they do notice any sort of new activity, you will get notified. So, um, you know, if you do, like I said, belong to AAA, I know that they also have like a credit monitoring that you could subscribe to. You know, in addition, like I said, to places that a lot of you probably already subscribe to, like Credit Karma um, and things like that. And as I mentioned earlier, 
um, keeping your old accounts active. So again, if you have an account maybe that you haven't used for an extended period of time, you know, making a charge on it to keep the activity going is definitely recommended. Again, I don't recommend closing the account even if you're not using it because if you close it, it's going to stop your credit history and your trade line at that point that you close it. So, um, yeah, make a charge on an account that you may not have been using um, for an extended period of time. Also, it's a good idea to limit your balance transfers. So even though transferring balances, let's say to a teaser rate, and it could be an effective way to get out of debt, but it also could negatively impact your credit score because typically what will happen is, number one, you're opening up a new account. So you're applying for a new account, which is going to cause a hard inquiry on your credit report. Typically, you're going to see um, about three to five points lower for your credit score for opening up a new account. And typically, when someone is trying to transfer balances from credit cards, they're going to usually try to transfer the maximum that they're given for credit. So what that means, they're going to be probably close to or at their credit limit when they open up this new account to try to get, you know, as much transferred over as possible. So that's something you want to just kind of be mindful of. Um, you know, doing balance transfers, although it could inevitably save you on interest, it could potentially still impact the credit score. Um, avoid, you know, excess credit applications. So again, when you apply for credit, your score will decrease just a bit. Typically, I've seen about three to five points. And if you're applying for credit frequently, a creditor can see that as a sign that someone is needing to rely on credit to pay their bills. So again, you know, um, not applying for too many credit applications. And last but not least, you have to be patient. So one of the biggest factors in credit is time. So you may feel like credit mistakes are going to haunt you forever. But remember, your payment history from the past two years is much more important than what happened before that. So keep in mind that most negative information is removed from your credit report after seven years. Typically, again, with the exception of a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And potentially, it could be if you have a judgment, and that could be renewed for an additional 10 years. So those are some ways to improve your FICO score. So for those of you who maybe have had some challenges with your credit score, these are some um, suggestions that you can look at to improve the FICO score. Next slide. One of the other things that I see for people who are looking to maybe establish credit, who have never had credit before, or they're looking to reestablish credit. One of the participants mentioned, you know, that they were looking to reestablish their credit. So there are steps that you can take to establish or reestablish your credit. So a quick fix to any damage report is to pay off your old debts. So pay in full make payment arrangements, offer a settlement, and a settlement's a lump sum payment that will satisfy the debt, but you're paying less than the amount that you owed. Typically, it's gonna look better on your credit report for paying um, an old debt or a collection, especially if you're looking for things like applying for an apartment rental, because they're gonna look at that and they're gonna see that you at least attempted to pay the debt versus leaving it unpaid. You also wanna look at applying for a secured credit card. 
So this is one way to eliminate the risk of a lender's willingness for you to establish an account with them. So unlike with a regular credit card, a secured credit card requires you to make a deposit with the creditor, which they will keep in the event that you stop making payments. Now with a secured credit card, it's typically easier for you to get one of these accounts than a regular credit card. Now the credit limits on these secured cards are usually low and the fees on them can be high. So it's definitely something you wanna research when you're looking at secured credit cards. You wanna look at, do they charge me an annual fee? What are they requesting for an upfront um, deposit? And another thing that I recommend is if you currently have a bank that you're working with, check with them to see if they do offer secured credit cards because a lot of the times you already have a relationship established with that bank. There's also another good website. If you wanna put this in the chat box, it's Nerd Wallet. And Nerd Wallet is another good um, resource. You can go on there and they will have a tab for secured credit cards that you can look at. And it gives some good secured credit cards to also look at. You know, a lot of my clients have had a lot of success in um, getting secured credit cards um, from that website. So I would say Nerd Wallet would be another good resource. Some other ways to help establish or reestablish credit is to ask for a family member or a friend to co-sign for you. Make sure though they have a good credit history. Now it's also important to be careful because with this type of an arrangement, you know, if this person would make late payments, it's going to reflect poorly um, on your co-signers report as well. So, um, so that's something you want to be careful about um, is co-signing. The other thing is sometimes you can be an authorized user on someone's account. So what that would mean, for example, my mother has an account and she's gonna put me on her account as an authorized user. So when I pull up my credit report, I'm gonna be able to see that, um, that on my credit report, but I'm not responsible for making the payments but it will sometimes help to um, establish or improve your credit score. But again, you have to really be confident that this person is going to not only make payments on time, but they're not carrying large balances on the um, account that they put you on as an authorized user. And again, many credit reports may contain mistakes. So that's why you wanna review them at least annually to make sure that all the information that's on your credit reports is accurate. And that's where disputing any sort of mistakes is gonna be very important. Next slide, but I think we might've had a question. I saw something pop up in the chat box. Akil's been answering the questions in the chat. Oh, thank you, Akil. Now, have any of you come across like an ad online or an advertisement on TV or even gotten like a personal email saying the company can increase your credit score by lots of points? Now, if these advertisements seem too good to be true, they probably are. So these companies that you see, they claim to repair consumers' credit reports, but they often charge high fees. Now, typically they go, the way they go about doing this is they may dispute any sort of negative information on your credit report, even though it may be accurate information. So once the information is disputed, 
if the credit bureau is unable to investigate the claim within 30 days, the information will get removed temporarily. Now, this rarely works since they are generally able to respond in time to address the dispute. Now, even if the information is removed due to a backlog of requests, it will be re-reported by the creditor or it could be at a later date. So you really want to be cautious of, you know, these places that say we can improve your credit score. And then another way that I've seen that these um, companies work is they sometimes can issue consumers a new identity. And this is something that I, you know, just had found some information about. So they may issue consumers a new identity with a tax identification number to use like a social security number, this is illegal. So this is something that I heard, you know, was a new thing by trying to issue um, consumers a new identity. Now, there really is no legal way to remove accurate and timely information from a credit report. Now, I recommend it's better to take steps yourself to dispute any incorrect or outdated information or that's why we're here as financial coaches to assist you and guide you through the dispute process. And again, you can do it on your own free of charge. So you don't need to go to a company um, to do it for you. Um, you can do it on your own. Howard, you're kind of fading in and out. Okay, is this better? Yes. So as I was mentioning, it's always better to dispute something yourself or get the advice of a financial coach because it is free of charge to make disputes as opposed to going to a company that's going to say, you know, we can do it for you. We can boost your score, all these points. Um, because again, these companies are typically not really reputable or they're going to charge high fees. And also I would recommend you look at the better business website, because you may find that they have a lot of complaints levied against them. So be aware of these credit, re credit repair places that say they can repair your credit. Next slide. So learning to manage your money is really vital. So by designing a realistic spending plan or a budget, and this is something that we work with, you know, with clients during a coaching session, you will be able to avoid using credit to supplement your income. Now, this is going to inevitably reduce your credit score, even if you're making your payments on time. So you really want to, you know, stay clear of having to rely on credit cards to pay your um, expenses on a monthly basis. Now, since so much of your score is based on your payment history, part of every good money management system is knowing when your bills are due and never making late payments. Now, if you have excess cash, and I know that may be difficult for a lot of us, it really should be used to try to make good on paying off old debts. Now, if there's not enough money to pay the debt in full with your current income and expenses, see if you can cut down on some of your spending or increase your income, because those are definitely some ways to help look at, you know, balancing your budget. And again, you know, those are things that we, we typically recommend during a coaching session. If we're looking at a situation where let's say you're coming up with a deficit every month, meaning that you're spending more than what you're making, we really wanna have you look at your budget or spending plan and see where you might be able to make some reductions in expenses. Howard, you're cutting out quite a bit now. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, so maybe working um, with your financial coach and looking at areas where you might be able to cut down on some of your expenses or looking at are there ways to increase my income, work overtime, supplement my income, maybe with a part-time job. So these are um, some other ways that you can look to um, better manage your money. Also, having a healthy money management plan can include things like an emergency savings account. And typically what we recommend is three to six months worth of your essential living expenses is recommended that you save for emergencies. So that way, if you have a crisis, you, you know, lose your job, you become sick, um, and you're not able to have a source of income coming in, instead of using a credit card or taking out a loan, which would inevitably lower your credit score, you would have this emergency savings to fall back on. Lord, can you repeat that? Because you cut out and we missed the, the um, last bit of your last sentence. about saving for emergencies. Okay, so when you're saving for emergencies, we definitely recommend trying to look at what your essential living expenses are, my rents, my utilities, my groceries, and you really wanna work towards a goal of having at least three to six months saved for emergencies. <laughs> because if something was to happen, like you lost your job or you got sick and you couldn't, couldn't work, you want to know that you could at least cover those essential expenses, things like rent, utilities, groceries for a minimum of three to six months. Um, so you don't have to rely on taking out a credit card or a loan or, you know, having to go to, let's say, like a payday loan company that charges really high interest rates. <clears throat> or even I've seen some clients get a title loan on their paid off vehicle. So, you know, having um, a savings for emergencies is definitely something if you don't have, you really want to work towards, um, work towards um, having that. <clears throat> Next slide. Now, how many of us track our expenses? A lot of us may go to the ATM, take $40 out, fast cash from the ATM, and it disappears really quickly. We don't really keep track of where it's going. So tracking expenses is really important because it can provide an understanding of where your money is going each month. So in the beginning, what I would recommend is spend as normal. And you can then look at your um, tracking at a later date and make adjustments as needed. So there are some ways to kind of like effectively, you know, track your expenses. And I recommend you may want to kind of consider these options. But again, you want to look at the one that's going to work best for you. So that that way you keep utilizing that way um, to keep tracking your expenses. One of the ways that you can track your expenses, and this may be old school, but a lot of you know clients still do this, where I recommend maybe having a notebook and just writing every purchase down that you've made. Keep receipts for like any purchases that you make. You can maybe put them in an envelope and, you know, tally them up at the end of the month. Typically, what I like to do is organize my receipts. So I may have different envelopes for different things. Also, one of the other things that I found that's a good thing is, you know, when you go to the ATM and you're pulling money out of the ATM, we may not necessarily know where that money is going to. 
So what I've done in the past and other people have done is to maybe, you know, ask for the receipt when you're pulling money out of the ATM and just physically write on the ATM what you're using that $20 for and then put it aside. And that's going to be another good way to kind of track your ATM withdrawals. Or, you know, if you're using a debit card or a credit card, those are also some ways that you can get your statements that you can be effectively tracking where you're spending your money. Um, Howard, I can't, we can't hear you. If you could just face your microphone, then it, it usually works. I am doing that. <laughs> okay. So I'll try the best I can. Now, there's also like online computer tracking programs that some people are currently using. So these may be things like Mint, um, maybe a program I've heard that clients use. Now, a lot of banks and credit unions, they also have their own computer software tracking programs. So if this is something that you wanna look at, you may want to look at online when you're doing um, online banking with your financial institution and see if they have any tools that will maybe assist you um, to track your monthly expenses. So that would also be something else that I would recommend that you look at as well. And this could be another way to more effectively track your monthly expenses. Next slide. Now it goes without saying, but living within your means, it seems like the most common sense idea to do. But you know, this can be actually challenging. Now increasing your income is another way to kind of increase your cash flow, but it's usually the one we have the least amount of control over. Now, things you can do to maybe look at increasing your income, working overtime, maybe getting a part-time job if that's possible, apply for a promotion, or maybe selling some assets that you have. Um, you know, I, I have some clients that maybe they have storage units and they have items in them that they might be able to sell. You know, there's ways now even, you know, I've seen on Facebook, Marketplace, maybe items that you have that you're not using, you can put them up for sale. Um, so these might be some other ways to increase your income. Although it's not always easy, something that we should look at is prioritizing our spending. Now, most of us may have expenses that we're not able to reduce or eliminate in our budget. You know, it's very challenging to, you know, reduce or eliminate your debt. I mean, it's possible if you want to maybe look for a less expensive rent, but you may currently be in a lease. So, you know, that may be, you know, difficult. You could consider maybe looking at moving into a family member's, you know, home or, you know, um, you know, a friend that may have a room that's available to rent. You know, these might be some ways to kind of reduce And again, these are typically fixed expenses that we look at on a monthly basis. So again, those may be some areas that may be more difficult to reduce. You also want to kind of look at your budget and maybe think about areas, again, that you might be able to reduce. Things that maybe you can postpone or you can maybe substitute other things. Maybe things like, for example, you know, um, there are a lot of resources out there in San Francisco where museums may offer, 
you know, like a free, you know, entrance on certain days of the week. So, you know, I would try to take advantage of anything that there might be, you know, in San Francisco, where they might have, um, you know, things that are free, you know, offered to the public. And the library has a lot of, you know, free things as well. I think they have story time and Leah can probably, you know, go over some of those or you can look on the website, you know, so these are, you know, a good way to kind of substituting for maybe things in your budget that you may have previously spent money on. Using coupons, you know, I even use coupons, you know, when I'm buying things, um, you know, um, that's also another way to try to cut down on your expenses. Um, Howard, LA, uh, Akil would like to um, say something. Perfect. Akil, um, I think you're muted. I'm sorry, I, I was just giving you a time check. It's, it's 310. Um, I wanna make sure you um, we able to cover all the slides there. So just gonna give you a time oh, check. Great, I think we're almost done. So a few more minutes. Next slide. So really excessive debt can derail any budget. So you should try living on a cash only, you know, lifestyle. Um, really look at, you know, keeping emergency cards at home rather than in your wallet. Try to increase your monthly payments, paying more than your monthly minimum amount. And, you know, try to reduce your interest rates. So these are definitely some ways to try to um, work on, you know, reducing your debt um, more aggressively. Next slide. Now, do you think it's wise to repay debt and build credit while saving for other goals? You not only can, but you should. You know, not only paying down your debt um, more aggressively, but also, you know, trying to save as much as possible um, so that you don't rely on credit for emergencies. And then you may have cash available later for um, down payments, things like maybe renting an apartment. Next slide. So what are you going to do now? Think about what can you do today what can I do in the next three months? And what can I do this year? Next slide. Now a smart money coach can help you to create a realistic and workable budget that will help you to determine how much you can effectively contribute to savings, develop a spending plan to eliminate your debt more effectively, help you improve your credit score, and also review your credit report so you can make sense about what's on there. And we do provide a lot of other assistance. Next slide. Okay, so I have put down here, do we have another slide? Can you go back from this slide? Yeah, I think you missed one. Um, the one previous to this, please. Um, yeah, um, that one, yep. So if you're ready to make an appointment with a smart money coach, it is free, it's confidential. The phone number is there. Um, feel free to give us a call to make an appointment to speak with one of us. And then on the last slide, um, next slide, we'll actually give you some information about the company that I work for, Balance, and the main number and the website are there as well. So, I know we went over a little bit of our time, but you know, um, I hope that you've found this um, meeting um, informational and that you've gotten something out of it more than what you came into. Um, and I think that's all I have. 
All right, thank you so much, Howard. Um, we'll have to um, end this program as uh, we have other things to move on to. But thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Howard and Akil, for your expert um, advice. And we'll see everyone at the next program. Bye-bye.